Listen, we all knew it was going to happen, or at least I kind of anticipated that it would happen. As soon as my PragerU video got released, I kind of thought that I would start seeing weird articles pop up in weird locations, making fun of it, or making fun of me, or trying to discredit me, or any of these things. So I was ready for it. And generally speaking, I kind of feel the best thing to do in these circumstances is to mock these people incessantly and point out all the ways in which they are not real journalists that don't have any sort of integrity or bother to do many more than like 15 minutes worth of research so they can get their stupid clickbait article up online. And we have to congratulate our first contender, Andrew Paul, for jumping right in admirably and doing exactly what I thought you were going to do, Andrew Paul. Let's take a look at who Andrew Paul is, shall we? Um, he's on Andy Paul on Twitter, about a thousand followers, writes a newsletter called The Echo Chamber. I mean, I think that that's actually probably the most fitting thing I've ever seen in my life. But what I want to do is read this article in dramatic fashion, of course. We have to have dramatic voice. Dramatic voice is going to be coming out throughout this article, I have a feeling. And I want to make fun of it and obviously correct the things that he gets blatantly wrong and make sure that the truth is actually known because, you know, is as much fun as I like to have with this stuff, this is actually my life and this really did happen to me and to a lot of people that I care about. And so people like Andrew Paul, who probably, you know, have nothing better to do than to write bullshit articles, they probably have no idea what it's like to watch people that you know and care about get bullied and mobbed uh, to literally within an inch of their lives because one person actually checked himself into the hospital and suicide watch after this thing that Andrew Paul is making fun of. Now, for me, I don't actually think making fun of something that almost results in a literal suicide is actually all that funny, but since he started down this road, I'm damn sure going to make fun of fun of his contribution to this whole affair. Hide your knitting needles, hide your yarn, the online knitting mob is real, apparently. This is on a V Club, I have linked it in the description of the video if you want to go and check it out for yourself. Lock your doors and batten your hatches, people. The online knitting mob is real and it could be coming for you. At least that's what this video from the Trumpers at Prager you are claiming. Strap in, everybody. So first off, I think it's kind of interesting. He's like, strap in, get ready for it because he actually writes one of the laziest articles that I've seen written on this topic. If you want a good series of articles, you gotta look at Kat Katrin Jepsen, I say her name wrong all the time, I call her Catherine, but it's Katrin Jepsen Moore's articles on Quillette. She did a series of three articles. She actually did, she actually behaved as a journalist. God forbid people doing journalism actually behave as journalists, but go on Quillette, there's a series of three articles. It's probably the best coverage that it's gotten. Also, you can look at Unsafe Space on YouTube. They have a channel. They've interviewed people that were caught up in the knitting wars. They've done a lot of work on that as well. So those are two really good sources of actual journalism. All right, second point I wanna make about the first paragraph. Dude's already written two sentences. I'm already pulling it apart. The knitting mob doesn't just come for anyone, obviously. Like, first, you have to be a member of the knitting community. Um, usually on Instagram is mostly where actually this stuff takes place. A little bit on Ravelry, too, but not so much anymore for reasons that are going to be made clear in the article. So Instagram is where a lot of this has happened. A little tiny bit on Twitter, too, but mostly, like, I'm instigating the nonsense on Twitter, and I have little knitting stalkers that stalk me and make fun of me, whatever. But no, most of it happens on Instagram. So you have to be in the knitting community on Instagram, and a third qualification for being a target of the online knitting mob is you have to have some sort of presence in the knitting community. They don't just go after like grandma. They don't go after people with like three followers. They go after people with thousands of followers who have businesses that they can try to pressure into doing exactly what they want them to do. And then they say, we're going to threaten your business and cost you all your, all your customers if you don't do what we want you to do. So those are the people who are actually in danger of being a target of the online knitting mob. Lastly, I want to say, like, he's trying to paint this as though this evil Trumper did this thing. I was a Democrat when I went to the Donald Trump rally. I had no intention of voting for Donald Trump. When I wrote my article, I had no intention of voting for Donald Trump. I didn't actually decide to vote for Donald Trump until, like, Joe Biden was basically the Democratic nominee. And I was like, well, I'm sure as shit not voting for Biden. And... 
the Democrats have gotten even more crazy anyway, so of course I'm going to vote for Trump. But to say, to try to paint me as like a Trumper from the beginning is absolutely just not true in any way, shape, or form. Let's keep going. Okay, so a bit of background is probably needed. About a year and a half ago, Vox published a feature about the online knitting world's recent reckoning within their recent, excuse me, recent racial reckoning within their ranks, which, yes, probably sounds like a bit much upon first hearing it. Now, the Vox article is a hit piece. It's like an SJW piece. You can see here, I mean, it's like blatant SJW nonsense. The knitting community is reckoning with racism. Oh my God, no, we weren't. What the knitting community was reckoning with was bullies and mobbing. There was no racism going on in it. Well, okay, I shouldn't say no. I mean, I, I cannot unequivocally state that no racism has ever happened in the knitting community, obviously. I'm sure someone probably could point to that, but by and large, what we're talking about has nothing to do with racism, as evidenced by the fact that the very first thing that they talk about is Karen Templar. Karen Templar. So let's actually just read the first paragraph. I'm not going to read, or we'll read the first couple of paragraphs. I'm not going to read the whole article. Um, I've linked to the other article. You can find it from here. But it starts off, Karen Templar's Fringe Association Company is kind of like goop for knitting. There are tips and how-tos for navigating knitting's trickier maneuvers. These are knit-alongs for chunky cowls and cute fingerless gloves. There's an online store that sells fringe bags, which has come to be known in some circles as the Birkin of knitting bags. That's, that's all true. They're, they're expensive and they're highly prized bags. And, that's, and there's a blog where Templar puts her personal thoughts. On January 7th, this is um, from last year, not this year, she blogged explicitly about her upcoming trip to India. She wrote in 2019 would be her year of color. She said that as a child, India fascinated her. And then when an Indian friend's parents offered to take her on a trip, it was like being offered a seat on a flight to Mars. She spoke of her trip as though it was the biggest hurdle anyone could ever jump. If I can go to India, I can do anything, I'm pretty sure, Templar it should be noted, is white. This is the racism they're talking about. They're talking about a white lady being excited about going on a trip to India, and that is considered racist. That is the racial reckoning that Andrew Paul here is talking about happening. A white woman was, all, was always afraid of traveling all her life, finally got over the fear of traveling, and finally was very excited about taking the trip to India, and wrote a blog post about taking a trip to India, and then got mobbed so badly by the online mob that she had to issue, and it is still up to this day, I've actually done a video about it on this channel, she had to issue a full apology picking apart her blog post and noting all of her colonial attitudes and, and what she should do differently and confessing her sins to the online mob. That's what we're talking about. This is not real racism. This is make-believe. This is made-up nonsense, okay? Let's just be clear about that. But the, piece, but the piece details a pretty logical progression. A pretty logical progression? Are you fucking insane? But the piece details a pretty logical progression of events taking place within knitter forums and social media. POC hobbyist begins speaking out following a tone-deaf blog post. See, this guy's on board with a white lady taking a trip to India is racist. Is a tone-deaf blog post from one of the community's more popular personalities, which sparked a larger discussion about representation and whitewashing within a pastime somewhat known for its prohibited expenses and class associations. You want to know what you need to buy in order to be a knitter? You need to buy needles and yarn. Now, admittedly, there are some needles and some yarn that can get rather expensive, but there's also cheapo needles and cheapo yarn. You can be, you can, dude, you can start knitting today for like $5. Go to Hobby Lobby, get it. I don't even know if Hobby Lobbies are open, but if Hobby Lobbies are open, get a freaking ball of yarn at Hobby Lobby, get some knitting needles and go to town like five, ten dollars $10 absolute max. In fact, Andrew Paul, Andrew Paul, I will donate to you specifically the first $10 you need to get started with knitting because that's all you freaking, that's all I had when I got started with knitting. I wasn't making a lot of money. I bought a little kit from like Joanne's Fabrics or Michael's or something. It was like maybe $15, 20 I had knitting needles, I had a book, and I had a couple of skeins of yarn, and I knit a scarf, and that was how I started with knitting. I mean, like, this is not an expensive thing. But what he's really saying here is like, this, is, this was a discussion. This was a discussion. This was not a discussion. This was 
ongoing, constant bullying and nonsense. That's what this is. Someone should be able to write a blog post about going to India without fear of getting bullied for being excited about going to India as a white lady. Instead, what happened with Karen Templar is she had to apologize for her colonial attitudes for being excited about going on a trip to India. Are you effing kidding me? A few months later, okay, so in this one too, he's also skipping over the other mobbings that have happened. He's just not even mentioning them. So after Karen Templar, there was Maria Tuscan. Maria Tuscan is a white lady, charming, beautiful, awesome white lady who hand dyes these beautiful yarns. I mean, her work is awesome. It really is amazing. Um, all she did was post a video to her YouTube channel saying, I'm not comfortable with what I saw happening to Karen Templar and I'm going to leave Instagram. For posting that video, she didn't even call anyone out. She didn't say anything controversial. She was mobbed and bullied and had her business destroyed and later described herself as the most hated person in the knitting community. After Maria Tuscan came Nathan Taylor, also known as Sockmetician, on Instagram. Now, what Nathan did is Nathan had actually months or maybe even like a year before started a hashtag on Instagram called Diverse Knitty. And it was just like a fun thing. He likes to make up words. It's like one of his things. And so he started this hashtag called Diverse Knitty to try to encourage, uh, look at the, all the diverse voices in knitting. It was a good thing, right? So when all this bullying was going on, Nathan made up a poem, because this is one of the things he likes to do. He's very creative. Made up a poem calling for kindness in the knitting community. That's all it was. He posted it with the Diverse Knitty hashtag. And for his trouble, he was bullied and mobbed so badly that he wound up in the hospital on suicide watch, thinking his life was over. Now, Andrew, I get that you're trying to make fun of this, but that's not funny. It's not funny. And you're not being a journalist when you leave out the full breadth of stories. And I could go on and on and on and on and on about the shit that he has left out in this article. I could talk about Knit and Nibble, two men in London who were bullied for writing a book about knitting and desserts. They were bullied for writing a book and be called fat phobic for writing a book about desserts. Desserts. It was not a diet book. I could talk about Murray Buskey, who is a, a, a yarn store owner in New Zealand, who's been bullied and mobbed so badly because she tried to keep her yarn store open during COVID, got special permission from the government to do so because she supplies people in nursing homes who like knitting is a pastime. It's a mental health activity. They went after her and tried to get her yarn store shut down. I could talk about... I I could talk about Stephen B in Minneapolis. Stephen B, who owns a yarn store and a home in Minneapolis, which was blocks away from the riots, who was bullied and mobbed so badly because he was trying to take his mind off of what was going on a couple blocks away from his store, what could have been burnt down, by the way, and he had the gall to post knitting kits online. I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on talking about these stories that Andrew Paul here, who is not a real journalist, has not bothered to research at all or talk about out in his article. Let's keep going. A few months later, a popular knitting and crochet website issued a public statement banning pro-Trump sentiment being featured in their forums and an o- and online store, which was summarily pounced upon by conservative media as yet another example of the intolerance left war on whatever. This is when Ravelry banned all Trump supporters. What Andrew is also leaving out in his in his really crappy article is that it was also pounced on by the liberal media. Stephen Colbert did a whole segment about it. Did a whole segment. And by the way, I actually supported this when it happened. I haven't taken down those posts. You can look on my Instagram and see I supported this when it happened, mostly because I wanted politics off of my knitting site entirely. And I didn't really care. Like, I, if, if it meant banning the, the talk about Trump, I was fine with it because I just wanted to go on there and knit. I didn't want anyone talking about politics at all. I didn't understand why they were doing it on a damn knitting site. But so I actually supported this at the time. I regret, I kind of regret that decision now. Not really. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so that's what happened there. That was a whole big hullabaloo. Ravelry lost a lot of customers. Ravelry lost a lot of their users when this happened, which of course he's not writing about either. Let's keep going. A year has passed and one could be forgiven for thinking the online knitting reckoning had simmered down. It had actually simmered down for a while. Well, upon, well, according to the woman in this simply outstanding Prager Uvity. Well, I'll, I'll take the compliment. 
I'll take the compliment, Andrew. Okay, okay. According to the woman in this simply outstanding PragerU video, the leftist yarn uprising continues unabated, and that's cause for a serious reevaluation of where you're placing your allegiances. No, 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 no. Wrong, 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 wrong. You see, Andrew, I witnessed all the bullying that you didn't write about in your article that you didn't do research for, and that's what caused me to question my allegiances. All that stuff that happened last year, that's what caused it. I mean, you know, dude could have reached out to me. Like, I'm not hard to find. He could have, like, reached out to me and asked me, but of course, not a real journalist, and so he didn't. The rally that changed my mind recounts Carlin Borisenko's tragic disillusionment. Tragic, okay. With the online knitting world, after a handful of marginalized folks asked to be included in the proverbial knitting circle. That's not what happened. This was not about marginalized folks asking to be included in the knitting circle. This was about mobs of people, hundreds of people at a time, bullying other people. That's what it was about, Andrew. And again, if you had done any research on this topic, you would know that. And I keep harping on this because, listen, man, these are real people's lives. I get that knitting is not everyone's thing. I get it. I get that the drama in the knitting world is only really interesting to people like me who happen to be right smack dab in the middle of it. But these are real people's lives. Like, this asshole has put my name in this article making it seem as though I'm making a mountain out of a molehill and she just wants to exclude marginalized folks. And that's not what it is. Now, anyone can Google this and and find this and not know anything about me and not find this video and think that this is completely the truth. This is bullshit. It's not real. The online knitting mob is real. And like all mobs, it's mean. Should I do my Prager U voice? The online knitting mob is real. And like all mobs, it's mean. The truth is I'm more interested in a three in master the, the, it, I know the script better than this guy does. Oh my god. He, this dude has a script written right in front of him. He can't even quote it properly. The truth is I'm more interested in mastering a three-needle bind-off than discussing immigration policy. Thanks for the honesty, Carlin. Thanks for the shitty reporting, Andrew. The five-minute monologue, accompanied by cutesy animation, details Borisenko's decision to finally attend a Trump rally in New Hampshire to check out what all these supposedly intolerant MAGA fans are all about. Turns out, she had it completely wrong. You see, the Republican rally was all about optimism and energy, while her Democratic counterparts were just doom and gloom. Types who don't know how to kick back, relax, and accuse everyone they don't like of being a pedophile. Now, of course, I've never said either or any of those things, and what Andrew, of course, is leaving out is that I was a Democrat. I was a Democrat. Two days before the rally, I had attended another rally, a Democrat rally, with Pete Buttigieg's campaign team. I went with his freaking supporters, man. I attended the exact same place, and it was doom and gloom. You can watch videos of this. This is not even hard to find. You can watch videos of this on the internet. Like, do some fucking journalism, dude. Um, and I never said they don't know how to kick back, relax, and accuse everyone they don't like of being a pedophile. I would never say that. I've never even talked about that. What are you talking about? Stop making shit up and publishing it on the internet like it's real, you goddamn hack. And as for the online knitting wars, they carry on, unabated. The red, white, and blue quilts of our forefathers burning beneath the feet of string-clad communist hobbyists. Okay, whatever. This is this is so ridiculous. It's like this <laughs> This is like 15 minutes of research at best just to like meet a deadline or get like paid for a random article. I don't even know what the hell this is. Um let's see what Andrew Paul is. Like let's 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 find out more about him. Andrew Paul, this this fantastic act of journalism that we've just seen right here that's all raging bullshit. Andrew Paul is a contributing writer with his works recently featured by NBC Think, GQ, Slate, Rolling Stone, McSweeney's Internet Tendency. I don't even know what that last one is. He writes the newsletter Echo Chamber. So this is all a lesson for you. If you ever see Andrew Paul's work showing up in GQ, Slate, Rolling Stone, or NBC... You can know it's all complete bullshit because he doesn't know how to be a journalist and, you know, just make shit up that has no basis in reality at all. All right. 
I hope that was fun for you. That was kind of fun for me. I was, I know I was talking a little bit fast there. I was just like, really, I was actually kind of excited to find this article pop up and have a chance to mock it incessantly. So if you like this video, if you want to support my channel, make sure you hit the subscribe, give it a thumbs up, turn on those notifications. If you think you're subscribed, hey man, just double check because YouTube's actually been shadow banning me lately, which is super fun, but kind of like par for the course. All right, guys, that's all for now. I'll see you soon.